Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, to talk about these issues and to celebrate um, this piece of work that we're going to talk about tonight and hopefully you will all see in the coming weeks. Um, the other night I was at the 50th anniversary gala for the Mexican-American Legal Defense Fund, MALDEF. And to begin that evening, Father Gregory Boyle, who some of you might know if you are uh, awake uh, and alive in Los Angeles, is one of the great um, icons of social justice in Los Angeles, one of the great icons of compassion in Los Angeles. And he began the evening with an invocation. And I am not Father Gregory Boyle. I cannot do it justice. Um, but I wanted to just share one part of that invocation to uh, begin this evening, our very own kind of invocation. He said, soon we must imagine a circle of compassion. Then we imagine no one standing outside of that circle, moving ourselves closer to the margins so that the margins themselves will be erased. We stand there with those whose dignity has been denied. We locate ourselves with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. At the edges, we join the easily despised and the readily left out. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. We situate ourselves right next to the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. Those are issues and promises and goalposts that I think motivate the work and the experiences of everybody who's going to be joining us tonight that I think is at the heart of this, um, of this piece. Uh, and so to kick us all off, um, we're going to start with the town itself, um, with the leadership of Compassion and Welcome. Um, uh, and so it's my pleasure to welcome Mayor Percy Farwell, who's been a Gander resident for over 50 years and spent 27 years in the public sector of Gander with the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. He was the first elected to Gander's town council in 1993 and was subsequently re-elected in 1997 and 2001, serving 12 years in various positions of leadership, including nearly six years as deputy mayor. In 2017, he returned to the political arena and was elected as Gander's ninth mayor. But most importantly for this conversation tonight, he is active in community theater, where he has been on stage with the Avion players for over 30 years. Please welcome Percy Farwell. Thank you very much. And uh, whoops, broke it already. And thanks to uh, Jay and the, and the Center for uh, Public Diplomacy uh, for the invite to be here in LA and to participate in this event. It's uh, greatly appreciated. I appreciate the opportunity to represent uh, the people that this story is really about and, and the, uh, the, uh, the actions that, that this story is all about. I'm, uh, I'm a long way from home. I am a come from away here today. I'm uh, 3,500 miles from home. Um, which I'm very grateful for today because I'm 3,500 miles away from the snow that fell in my driveway yesterday. <laughs> Not sure how grateful my wife is that I'm 3,500 miles away from home, but she'll get over it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm from Gander. It's the crossroads of the world. That name wasn't given to Gander after 2001. It's uh, something that Gander came by honestly. Gander's an airport town. The airport was there before the town. It was there built in the 30s as a, um, as a, because it was a strategic location for the early days of transatlantic flight. And over the years, it's played a major role in international aviation. And anybody who was anybody in the early days of international uh, uh, flight has passed through uh, our town. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm currently the deputy mayor, or currently the mayor there. I was the deputy mayor during the events of 9-11, uh, and my, my uh, uh, predecessor and colleague, uh, Claude Elliott, was the mayor in those days. But this story has nothing to do with me or Claude or the government or, or the municipal government and so on. It's about, um, it's, it's about the people, as I said, in the events. Um, maybe uh, I, I'm, I'm 
calling upon Lisa to give me a hand here with the slides so she can just click into number two here. Um, that's it. Now, that's, that's Gander Airport on uh, September 11th, 2001. It's not a typical day for Gander International Airport. It may look like a typical day at, at LAX, <laughs> but it certainly isn't. Uh, since the Second World War, when thousands of aircraft were ferried across the North Atlantic to participate in the Second World War, we haven't seen that kind of traffic in our airport at any one point in time. But more than a picture of aircraft, uh, you know, I guess what you see when you look at that is, is a bunch of aircraft on a nice day on a, on a tarmac. But what, is re what that is to me is, uh, you know, it's, it's a context that's all in there. These aircraft were in Gander for a particular reason, and it was not a, a pleasant one. It was, uh, you know, we were, uh, there was a very dark day in our history. Uh, it was, it was uh, you know, and very dark events were occurring at the time. As a result of that, American airspace had been closed. And these 38 uh, passenger and four military aircraft had dropped out of the sky to share some time with us and were ordered to do so uh, because they were all potential terror, terrorist uh, threats. And uh, that's the context they came to Gander in. And on those airplanes, there were 6,595 human beings. There was 17 cats and dogs, and two rare bonobo apes. And uh, can't speak specifically for the dog, cats and dogs and apes, but I certainly know uh, uh, that the people were uh, were in st you know a state of distress, confusion, uh, uncertainty. Some had some knowledge of what was going on and why they were in Gander, and some did had very little knowledge. Many, perhaps most, had no idea where Gander was. So, um, you know, it was it was a, a very uh, a very different day, a very unique day, and not what, not as serene as it might appear in that, in that picture. Um, after many hours of uh, these people being in these aircraft, uh, they were you know, they were processed for security reasons and so on. They were allowed to disembark, um, and at that point, the town of Gander and, and through its emergency preparedness plan and so on, was tasked with the task of looking after these people for as long as they may be in Gander, which was a complete unknown at that point. Um, I should point out that the town of Gander is, at the time was 9,600 people, and that the uh, infusion of 6,595 people into our community that day represented about a 70% increase in our population. And that would be challenging enough. I mean, we have a few hotel rooms, certainly not enough to accommodate anywhere near that. Um, that would be uh, challenging enough, but uh, these people did not even have the, uh, the benefit of any luggage, and they were in a state of, uh, of distress for the most part and, and confusion. And eventually when they got off that airplane and we watched them disembark and we knew we were taking responsibility for them, they were from 95 different countries. Uh, we didn't care uh, where they came from. We didn't care what race they were. We didn't care what religion they were. We didn't care what sexual orientation they were or what gender identity they were, how old they were. All we knew was that there were 6,595 people, plus some cats and dogs and, ch and apes, uh, who were fellow travelers on the earth with us, and they needed help. And we had been blessed with the opportunity to provide it. Um, and our people uh, sprung into action, uh, you know, putting their personal values in, in action to try to make that happen. So it's in that context. Uh, yeah. Okay, the next slide there is, so began a five-day period of, of dealing with all, as you can imagine, the logistical issues of, uh, of uh, managing that sort of an influx of people who, had to be, who were in a state of distress, who... Uh, who had to be kept together and by, by aircraft in, in various buildings around town and, and surrounding communities. This is not a story of specifically Gander. We get all the credit in the, in the musical, but this happened not just in Gander, not just in surrounding area, not just in Newfoundland and Labrador, but in, in various places across the country. There were actually, I think, 255 aircraft grounded in, in Gander that day, or in, uh, in Canada that day. Um, the story of Gander, I think, resonates because of the, the, you know, obviously the context that it was taking place in, and the, um, and the, uh, I'm getting a signal here. 
five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the context and, of course, the scale in relation to the size of the uh, community. Um, these people have needs. They needed food, shelter, clothing, and they had emotional needs, which were probably more important than anything. And they needed hugs, and they needed love, and they needed reassurance. And uh, through, the, through the five, uh, five days that we had them with, with us, I think we, we saw a transition from uh, fearful strangers who, who uh, joined us on the first day to uh, uh, friends uh, after, after being with us a couple of days. And if we can uh, see the next, uh, the next slide there. By the time they were ready to, uh, ready to depart, what we had was the equivalent of family members that had spent some time with us. And uh, there were tears of joy and gratitude and, uh, as, as they left. And it was like, like I say, family members leaving us. And you see there uh, some of the goodbyes. And one of our groups of family members, as they, uh, as they got on board their aircraft and, and went about their, their way. But the legacy of all this is the, the bonds uh, that were created during that time, the, um, the, uh, the story or what unfolded, I guess, and the, the telling of it by uh, various means, including uh, and particularly the, the arts community through the musical Come From Away has, uh, has really uh, provided the, the ultimate reward to anybody that did anything in those days. And that is, you know, the impact that the retelling of this story has on uh, people that are uh, encountering it uh, and, and, and causing them to reflect on their own kindness and compassion to their fellow human beings and recognizing the power and the value of, uh, of you know, putting your individual uh, values in action with respect to other people and honoring the, the golden rule of doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you, which is not a, a necessarily a, a, a religious uh, thing, although it is, it is the basis of uh, most religions in the world. But I think it's just a very, very basic story of uh, people being kind to other people and the benefit that can have to people on both sides of that equation. And we're very uh, honored to have been fortunate enough to be able to help some people. Normally when disasters happen around this world, you know, we, we, we look at them and we wonder how we can help. And the best thing we can usually do is, is write a check and send it to someone and hope they do something good with it for the people that are, that are in... Uh, that are in trouble. And in our case, we feel we were truly blessed that we were uh, able to uh, tangibly help people. People appeared on our doorstep that we could actually help and sort of exercise those, those feelings. Our people don't feel that there's any big deal of what was done in those days. A lot has been made of it. We feel it's what decent human beings should do to, to do for their, their fellow man. And... Um, and we feel that you know the same would be done for us in, in if had this happened, and we're were we, were we part of it uh, somewhere else in the world. Some have told me that it's perhaps not true in some some areas, but uh, I truly believe that people are inherently good, and to the you know as long as they're not too, the goodness is not overly filtered with uh, with you know, political ideology or religious ideology or or whatever. Uh, I think there's there's goodness in all, and uh, this this story is just a one little uh, micro view of of uh, what can happen when good people act on their instincts. Um, is there a final slide there? I can't even remember. Is it? Oh, there you go. So so what we're left with, I'll just leave that up there for a second. That's kind of a it's it's a, a bit symbolic, I guess. It's this is in the years post 9/11. Well, you, this is a, a, a picture from the lobby of the town hall in Gander. You'll see the, of course, the Canadian, American, and Town of Gander flags, and and uh, you know, grounding all of those is the uh, is a section of steel from the World Trade Center that was uh, donated to the Town of Gander by the fire department in in New York as a as a sign of gratitude for the involvement of our citizens and the citizens of our area and you know, essentially our our country uh, during those days. So we're. I'm honored to be here and happy to, looking forward to participating in the discussion, particularly around the, the role of the arts and, and this production in, uh, in the value that has come out of this 
you know, what started as a very horrible story. Thank you. Great. Percy, you can actually take your seat up here. And I'm going to intro briefly introduce um, the other panelists and ask you all to come on up as, uh, as you're announced. Um, first, please welcome Doug Baker, uh, who is in his 29th season at the Center, Center Theater Group here in Los Angeles. Previously, he managed Broadway and touring productions uh, like True, Born Yesterday, Annie, A Chorus Line, Working, The Wiz, and Legends, among others which premiered at the Amundsen Theater in 1986. Uh, he's a member of the Achievement Hall of Fame and Chagrin Falls School in Ohio and a graduate of Albion College, an active member of the Broadway League Independent Presenters Network and a proud member of the Association of Theatrical Press Agents and Managers. And in May of 2013, Doug received the Broadway League's prestigious Outstanding Achievement in Presenter Management Award. Please welcome Doug Baker. Next up, Jacqueline Lianga uh, was the guest director of VR and Immersive Storytelling at Film Independence inaugural VR and Immersive Storytelling Showcase at the LA Film Festival this fall. She was previously the director of the prestigious AFI Film Fest and has been a panelist and moderator of industry panels at the Berlinale, the Cannes Film Festival, the Forbes Women's Summit, uh, and the Toronto International Film Festival, among many others. Please welcome Jacqueline. <laughs> Last but not least, Cynthia Strom, producer of Come From Away, graduated, as you heard, from this place uh, last year. Right, Cynthia? <laughs> yeah. Uh, has worked in the film industry, uh, producing national television commercials, went on to focus on personal investments in startup businesses and philanthropy, um, she was, I and mean, this is a great bio, she was also, you know, who wasn't the U.S. ambassador to Luxembourg um, and also served on the boards of Pacific Northwest Ballet, Channel 9, KCTS, Public TV, the Jewish Television Network, a contemporary theater, and most recently, the Shoah Foundation. She's also the national chair of the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Please welcome Cynthia. I'm going to join you all. Thank you all for being here. Um, You're welcome. And thank you, Percy, for those opening, opening comments. Um, I wanted to maybe start, Percy, with you, um, just to pick up on some of, of the um, kind of context and background. Um, and I mean, you talked about the general reasons and logics and also the general sentiments and feelings um, in a very beautiful way. And I wonder if you could talk a little about the specifics, whether you think in hindsight, the specifics of the kind of crisis that 9-11 was, how much that impacted the way the town responded, i.e., would it have responded to any other crisis, do you think, in the same way? Or was there something particular about that particular crisis that influenced the town? Well, um as I said, I think I think the the context that uh, that the this you know if, if we're describing the crisis as the as the influx of people into our community, then the the context that that was occurring in, and the the events that were happening in New York and and Pennsylvania and Washington and so on, and the emotions that we as as humans feel when we see these things happening and we see people that are uh, distressed and in harm and being harmed and so on. Uh, I think you know the instinctive uh, reaction is to want to help, and I think uh, you know this was a very horrific and unique day in our history. So uh, it's certainly that's certainly part of what drove the uh, the uh, willingness and the uh, the um, anxiousness of, of people in our community to come forward, or, and our you know all of our communities to come forward. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that. There would not have been, uh, you know, uh, uh, support coming forward in, in uh, uh, you know, some other form of uh, situation, uh, but certainly the, the the context and the uh, the, the, uh, the magnitude of what was happening, and you know, as we realized what the significance, what was going on, that was causing these people to be here, was something that was difficult for all of us to comprehend, and uh, probably a little therapeutic for us to be distracted by having the opportunity to help 
help people in, in, that, uh, in that context. So, you know, uh, if, if a crew, group of people just uh, all arrived in Gander at one time because they had the mechanical problems on their aircraft, uh, I'm sure we would have still responded, but I'm not sure it would have been the exact, you know, it would have been the same. So what did you think when you heard that there was going to be a musical? <laughs> well, we didn't quite know what to make of that because uh, <laughs> we really, truly, I mean, it's not like false humility or anything. We really, truly didn't think it was such a big deal what, what went on in Gander at the time. It was a normal reaction to a, a very abnormal situation, I guess. And uh, the thought of it being, uh, you know, somehow influencing the writing and production of a Broadway musical was not something any of us had contemplated, I don't think, until, until David and Irene showed up, you know, 10 years later to uh, do the interviewing and, uh, and uh, start the process of writing the musical. And some people in Gander were known to say, so you're going to write a musical, a Broadway musical, about a bunch of people making sandwiches. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> So what, what do we know about writing Broadway musicals? Clearly nothing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, you know, uh, we were flattered, I guess, that, the, you know, that someone thought that the story uh, was uh, significant enough to, to pay that sort of attention to. But we've always been a little uncomfortable with the amount of uh, attention focused on, on, you know, our people and the response because... We really didn't think it was that big a deal, and that it was maybe maybe the scale of it was large, but uh, it's really just you know people doing what decent human beings should do to other human beings, and uh, but we're certainly flattered. <laughs> May I just jump yes, in quickly on that? It reminds me of something. Uh, when you speak with David and Irene, the authors, David Hine and Irene Sankoff. Uh, they talk much about this, that in fact, when they went to Gander uh, at the 10th anniversary of um, the tragedy of 2000, uh, 2001, 9-11, they really didn't know what they would find there, wh whether there would be a story. It's my understanding that the Canadian government uh, awarded them a grant to write a show uh, focusing on some event in Canada, something about Canada, and they came up with this idea in large part because they were in New York City on 9-11. And once they heard that this uh, reunion, if you will, was going to take place 10 years later, they thought, well, let's go find out. We may go and find nothing. We may go and find something that will inspire us to write about. And, and then if you read more about what they have to say about that, they uh, were just surprised and wonderfully surprised with how many stories they heard while they were there and while they thought they might be there for a couple of days they ended up what standing a month I think I read there was they were there quite a while I don't, I don't and then follow. off they went and of course as I understand it to finish this up the Canadian government said write a show not necessarily write a musical but uh, from what I understand you they decided early on you can't write a show about Gander, something taking place in Gander without music, because music is so much a part of the culture of Newfoundland. Absolutely. Just, just for the record, this is really not um, helping me not want to move to Canada. So this is. <laughs> I'm sure that desire will. Think also... about the snow in the driveway. Well, yeah, think, you know what? Think about, think about what's in my driveway. Small price to pay for, <laughs> for human kindness. Um, <laughs> Maybe we'll someone will have we'll a get beer to before I get home. Yeah. We'll Most likely. In a minute. Cynthia, um, to what degree did your work as an ambassador and your experience in the diplomacy sector impact your interest in this project um, and your desire to come aboard and help make it possible? I don't know if there was a, is this on? I don't know if there was a conscious connection at all, really, other than just pure passion when I heard the story and saw it, when I heard the first read sing through of it, and I sat in my chair crying, and I still get emotional even thinking about it. I've seen the show 42 times and never get tired of it. Um, so I think it was really more about passion, and you all have to see the show to understand how good you feel 
when you finish seeing this and how you want to see it again and again. You want to take your friends uh, because in today's world, we don't get a lot of these feel-good kind of stories where people are just helping people. So then let me, let me flip the so, question then. I, I didn't how, answer that, did I? Uh, no, no, you did. How can you then use, how could you then use this musical or, or other oh. musicals in the diplomatic sector? It's been amazing, the diplomatic response to the show. Um, when we first opened on Broadway, uh, the first two invites went to Donald Trump and um, Justin Trudeau. Uh, Donald Trump neglected to come, but he did send Ivanka, and Ivanka went with Justin Trudeau. We've had the diplomatic corps take over half of the theater, um, which is pretty amazing, and we just opened the tour in Seattle, and the Canadian consulate came in and bought out a huge chunk of tickets. Um, the diplomacy has also been very interesting because one of the things that we did in Washington, D.C. early on is we, we did a special performance just for the firefighters, uh, for the first responders, and for the employees who were left of Cantor Fitzgerald. Um, that was one of the most dramatic previews that we did. It was a closed performance just for them. And um, we weren't sure how people were going to react. They weren't sure how they were going to react. And nobody wanted to look at each other because they all knew that they lost somebody, but they didn't know who. And uh, there's a wonderful, great line to the show about, um, do you want to come back to my house and take a shower? <laughs> <laughs> and that warmed the hearts of everybody. And, and the whole group came together. It was very cathartic. And... Um, one of, the, one of the more special times for the show. And that's Thank diplomacy you. at its best. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I'd add, we, you know, diplomacy takes place at many different levels, of course, and certainly at the ground level over the past, you know, period of time since, since the musical has become uh, well known and, and more people are becoming familiar with the story. We actually, at the Town Hall in Gander, we receive, and, and, and certain events are occurring in the relationships between our countries and so on. And we actually receive uh, emails, sometimes calls, more typically emails from citizens of your country who happen to have been, become familiar with the story and uh, wanting to reassure us that uh, they appreciate us and, and not, to, uh, not to take too seriously some of the things that are being said sometimes and apologizing. We actually, so, so it's interesting that, you know, everyday citizens are actually... Uh, you know, engaged in, in communicating with us to express gratitude to, to our country. And uh, that, I mean, if, if, that's, if that's spread over the, uh, at the ground level, I think that's very, very effective diplomacy. I, I just have to say that I've been to Gander, and the people are that nice. I mean, it's one of the most incredible places to visit. And uh, I mean, they, don't, they just open up their doors to you and say, come on in, and it's great. So, Doug, with this, with this coming to CTG, um, and by extension coming to Los Angeles, um, could you talk a little bit about where this piece fits within the mission of CTG, but also why this might be able to speak to Los Angeles? What kind of work could it do for the city of LA? Sure. Well, uh, as a not-for-profit organization, our primary purpose is to serve the community of Los Angeles. And we do that by presenting theater, which at its core is storytelling. Uh, and we want to do that at the highest level possible. Uh, we have three theaters. We produce and present in the Amundsen Theater, the Mark Taper Forum, and the Kirk Douglas Theater over in Culver City. Uh, Come From Away, which will be here in two weeks, will uh, obviously be at the Amundsen, the larger theater. And um, it fits our profile, I believe, beautifully because we're all about the storytelling. We want to find and produce and present the best uh, stories, the best storytellers uh, that we can find. For me, I, I try to keep it simple. The storytelling boils down to three things. It really boils down to technique, passion, and you have to have something to say. And f I believe quite strongly that Come From Away uh, hits 
all three of those. Now, we, we present a lot of shows. We produce a lot of shows at CTG. And, you know, some will be really good on the, on the passion and maybe need a little work on the technique part. But if the passion is strong enough and there's something to say, we'll go with it. I kid you not, Come From Away is, uh, for me, scoring as high as you can score on all three things that really represent um, the best of storytelling. I was lucky enough to track the show from the beginning. I saw it at La Jolla in 2015. I'm a big, big fan of the lead producers on the show, Sue Frost and, and Randy Adams. We've done other work with them. I saw the show, and it just swept me away. It is a very emotional show, uh, but in a very good way as well. You know, you, it, it doesn't push buttons just to push buttons, and that's because of the strength of storytelling. So to pick up on that, um, for you, Jacqueline, in your, in the amount that you've been exposed to storytelling, particularly in the film, in the context of film and filmmaking, in the broadest sense for you, what, are we being romantic up here? In the sense of, are we being right to suggest that art and stories can change the way people behave with each other? From your experience, what have you seen about the role of filmmaking, about the role of storytelling, in actually changing the way people think? Well, uh, from, from my perspective, it's difficult. I don't have data specifically on, you know, okay, if, it's, if it's actually changed how someone thinks. But I certainly have seen, you know, I, I just came back from a trip to India. I was at the Mumbai Film Festival. And, and there, it's a festival that's growing, and you see that, you know, to get around censorship laws, they make admission to the screenings free. And so they're able to show a wide range of films, so get outside of sort of the traditional Bollywood films and show Iranian cinema, and Jafar Pahi, Korean cinema. They can show American films, French films, films that perhaps have sensitive subject matter. And there were lines around the block, and people were having to be turned away from films. And so when you, you talk about, as we talk about art and, and the possibility of art, I think, and especially when I think about, you know, this, this story, the, the city itself and that airport, it's kind of this um, conduit in a way that I think art institutions can be for that kind of cross-cultural exchange. And it's not always about changing how someone thinks. Sometimes it's a bit of an influence or um, adjusting, uh, an adjustment that's made or an exposure to a new idea that causes them to rethink a decision. And so that I, I've def you definitely see and, and it's really exciting to see, especially in other countries. And that's where I do think that art and especially the fact that art can travel um, plays a really key role in, in diplomacy. So the, the, the piece originally debuted what year? Uh, 2015. 2015. So it debuted, La Jolla. it debuted at La Jolla in 2015 um, before the election of Trump. Um, Jacqueline, just to finish up that comment and then maybe to open this up to everybody up here, how have you seen anything with Trump's election that has changed the way artists Filmmakers, storytellers, storytellers are approaching their craft. I would say, from the perspective of again arts and just institutions and and festivals and kind of screening and events, that there's actually a greater sense of community, perhaps, and that that I find that the audiences and the artists are really excited to find um, specific films or shows where they can come together and have a dialogue about cross-cultural exchange. Um, so I, I feel that there's a real yearning that was there, but I think has really been amplified. Anybody else want to weigh in on uh, that? Well, I would agree. Uh, at CTG, we, um, through the efforts of uh, people like Tyrone Davis, we work hard on our uh, reaching out to the community and engaging them. Um, we do stage talks and we do community conversations. Uh, and we're f I'm certainly noticing that more and more the audience is engaging in those talks. I think that people want to talk about what they've just seen. Uh, we're not necessarily ramping up the number of works of theater that are um, very politically charged. We're not doing that. But um, on almost anything, we 
produced these days, it seems, as long as it's good, uh, people want to stay and talk about it. Especially with this show, uh, we discovered our very first performance at La Jolla. Uh, there was no, <clears throat> there was no music at the end <clears throat> to wrap it up. What happened at the end of that first performance is people just stood there, kind of dumbfounded, and they wanted to either hug the person next to them, or talk to the person next to them, or share their story about where they were on September 11th. <clears throat> and so we added about three minutes, four minutes of, of music at the end because. People just didn't want to leave the theater. Um, in the beginning, we had audiences that would stay afterwards in the lobby, where we would get kicked out by the theater owners, yeah. Yeah. because the audience members just wanted to share their stories with the cast members. It's been a really cathartic, interesting time. It's also been very interesting for kids, like we're looking in there, um, who, who don't have a recollection or memory of September 11th. And it gives them a whole different framework of a different time in our history. Um, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell people there are um, more people than ever in human history who are coming from away than ever before. One of the last images I saw before walking over here for this event tonight was a photograph at the Tijuana-San Diego border where military and Homeland Security had put barbed wire on the border wall. An image that I think reminds us of the urgency of what it means to come from away and what it means to welcome. Uh, and I hope that this piece is something that we all can use to think about um, what that means for all of us going forward. Um, so in that spirit, I'd like to open it up to you all um, for questions and comments. We have time for a few. Yes, sir. Are we waiting for a mic? Here we go. While the, while the Woolsey fire is still raging, we've had 265,000 people evacuated, lost, at least 110,000 acres, an area larger than the city of Denver. I've seen on social media people offering to make room in their homes for people who have evacuated and still can't return. So my question to you, I know this is all very new, but have you thought when this opens in Los Angeles about ways to bring the message of the play home to the stories that we're undergoing now in Los Angeles, whether it's doing another program for the first, for the incredible first responders here who are still battling the blaze, or the people in Thousand Oaks who had two horrors, the shootings at the Borderline Cafe and then the town burning down. So I just wondered if you've given thought to something that cannot be more timely for pain and healing that our city is going through. Thank you for that. A fantastic uh, suggestion, truly uh, heartfelt and, and genuine. Uh, we actually have not had a chance to talk about that, but uh, you bet we will. Uh, certainly, this is a great opportunity through this show to create bridges to, well, the show itself creates a huge amount of empathy. And uh, you make a good point. It's, uh, it's a very logical tie-in. So we will consider that. Thank you for the suggestion. Next question. Yes. Oh, one there and then one there. Thank you. Yes, I got you. You're next. Social media and questions don't go together. Hi. Hi. Um, I really appreciate your contributions to telling the story uh, revolving around 9-11. I was only a month old when it happened, so I think it's really important to um, keep the memory alive. My question is, how do you balance creating a work of art that is, um, how do you balance creating a work of art that is interesting with a story that is true? And how do you be truthful to the original context without creating melodrama? Is that to me? <laughs> My answer would be, and I'm not, I'm not teasing, um, is 
make sure you're hiring really terrific authors to write just that. I'm not an author. I'm a producer. Uh, my job is to support the creative uh, teams who come together uh, to um, write these shows. I think I have a strong sense of what the elements are that make up a high quality uh, show, a, a good story, but that's really not what I do. So um, I'm gonna pass on that, uh, on that answer, on that question, sorry. And, and I think to the credit of the, the writers and the pe those, all those creatively behind this particular show, it is very uh, true and honest, and, and there is, uh, I, I've not seen sort of artistic license taken uh, to make it more than it is or, or to sort of create a, a melodramatic uh, impact. Uh, it's actually a, a very accurate telling of, uh, of what did happen, it ha and it's a very simple story with a very uh, powerful message. And I think when the, the previous discussion around uh, uh, you know the impact of the of a story told through the arts on diplomacy. I think it's it's uh, very profound because I think uh, there's a, there's the message and the messenger, and when, and when the arts uh, is, is the messenger, I think sometimes there's uh, there's a more penetrating uh, message, and uh, this is particularly emotionally. So I think it's a it's a, a wonderful vehicle to uh, to um, deliver a very important message. There was a scene added to the show after La Jolla in Seattle, the Muslim strip search scene, which uh, the authors initially did not want to put it in the show because they felt that it would be melodramatic. Um, when we did it the first time, it, it spoke such truth to the world that we live in today that I think it added a great layer to, to the piece and to the honesty of what's happening in our world now when you go through an airport security. Um, but it wasn't to be melodramatic, it was an actual true story. The, the actual pilot after that first performance said that she was embarrassed and mortified because she had to witness this strip search and she just felt very just too exposed, sitting in the audience, that people knew that she was watching this. Um, but she realized the impact was so tremendous, they've, they've kept that scene in. It's one of the best scenes in the show. Yeah. Question right here. Yep. Let's get a mic for you. And then after this, we'll take one more question. Hello, my name is Ricky Orr, and I study theater and business here at USC. So this question is for Cynthia Strom and Douglas Baker. So like, Come From Away as a musical is, an, an is not an adaption of pre-existing work, and it doesn't have like a big star necessarily to sell it. So would you say that having just by telling a story this pure and powerful and like still relevant to today is what's kept it still running on Broadway and open three years after it first premiered? Well, most people would say we were nuts to do a show without a star. The beauty of this show is that there is no star right. and that it's truly a collaborative effort and the people look like us. They're real people with real bodies. It's, it's what's played so beautifully about this piece is the fact that we've got three casts now and they're all very interchangeable, and they're all very believable. And the freakiest thing is they all look like the real people that they're portraying. That's really the freakiest yeah. part. Yeah. I, and I would add that key, uh, from my point of view, to this show's success is that the producing team did not rush it along. They developed it, which is, again, one of the reasons that I, I'm so uh, in awe of these producers, is they... Um, developed it in a very slow, nurturing way. They, like I say, they didn't rush it. In fact, um, after numerous work readings and workshops, it finally got its first production at La Jolla, as we discussed, in 2015. They, at that point, they could have possibly made a move to New York. They said, no, we're not doing that. We have a plan. They took a long hiatus. They reopened in Seattle, at Seattle Rep. So again, under the protection of a not-for-profit theater, where 
box office results uh, was not terribly important. You know, they wanted to. But it broke the reps record. But it ended up, that's the thing, you know, amazing. And then from there, again, another hiatus, went to another not-for-profit, this time Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then again, a break, and finally in Toronto, and then into New York. So it's... Uh, we also wanted to build the audience. Build the audience we, yeah. and uh, make sure that the work is strong enough that you don't need a star and that it's resonating with audience. One other beautiful thing about this show is, you know, demand pricing is a big thing on Broadway these days, and we have kept our prices uh, stable uh, so that regular people can come see this show. And people come back multiple times, which is pretty incredible. One last quick question. In the back. Hi, my name is Myra Lozano. I am a student here at USC. I'm majoring in uh, the BFA acting program. I also work here with Annenberg, and I'm a CTG intern. Um, hey. <laughs> so I, it's not a question. I just really wanted to commend um, CTG on the season that they have brought to Los Angeles. I just saw Valley of the Heart. I'm a Latina who immigrated here to America when I was 10, and I have never seen anything on this stage done like Valley of the Heart. I brought my whole entire family. They were in tears. It was a big um, step forward into the right direction. As a storyteller myself, we're constantly battled with the material that we need to show to the world, and I am very inspired by you guys, and I think that Come From Away is going to be another step even bigger into that direction. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, and thank you. You're so right. The um, Valley of the Heart is just another terrific example of excellent storytelling. You know, the technique is there, the passion is there, and there's something to say. And had Luis Valdez not told that story, I'm not sure how many people in Los Angeles would, I mean, certainly some would remember the in internment stories. But um, thanks to Luis and our ability to work with him, uh, we're presenting a, a very, I think, important and entertaining show. That's, that's the other thing, you know, let's not forget, we're, we're not here to preach. We do believe in entertainment as well. And um, again, Come From Away, as well as Valley of the Heart hits on all those those points. Entertainment, empathy, um, building bridges. It's pretty cool. All right, one last question. Thanks for indulging me. Um, at the Center on Public Diplomacy, we look at different forms of public diplomacy in the toolkit, and film festivals are one way to present a story or a country image or a thematic image. So my question is for you, Jacqueline, over there. I would like to know, as a curator of film festivals, whether it's a theme or a geographical region, do you consider what the overarching through line may be to tell a story? And then how do real life events get um, massaged into the film festival with sensitivity, uh, provocateur, is there a connection between curating a film festival, telling a story, giving a message? Because it is a form of public diplomacy globally. So I'd like to hear a little bit about what you think about that. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think for a lot of festivals, it's also something that they've been had to wrangle with as there have been a lot, there's been a lot of um, political um, issues both within the United States and internationally. And you certainly see as a curator every year, you'll find filmmakers making work that reflects the times. And so you may not be looking necessarily for trends, but there's definitely, you will definitely find whether it's documentaries or narrative films that people are addressing the refugee crisis, that they're addressing the political system. Certainly right now there are some, I, some documentarians I ran into, um, Grace Lee the other day, and she's working on, she's been following all of the women in the election and they're still in Georgia. And so those are films we're going to start to see a year from now. So it's certainly, and then of course, you know, the response to Me Too, and as a curator and a programmer as well, what comes into 
into play as you think about the story. You think about your audiences. You think about your cultural partners. Um, certainly for me as a, a festival director and curator working with both communities locally as we promote films, but then also international agencies. So whether it's consulates or organizations like German Films or Unifrance that are based outside of the country, working with them to promote films, but then also really being conscious of what their artists are creating and what um, the political temperature is like as well. Um, certainly, you know, we've showcased films from Iran, um, you know, and, and at times by filmmakers who are under house arrest. And so having all of those factors, um, and then as well, if you want a filmmaker to come from a country that has restrictions on visas, then ensuring that you invite them with enough time to enable them to be at your event. So yes, certainly um, you think about all of these things about the story, um, but also about the context in which the story was created. And, uh, and you think about the context in which the audience is going to see a film. And then I think it really becomes important to create, as I was sort of talking about earlier, spaces um, for conversation, both between the artist and the audience, but then also for artists themselves, um, you know, to have their community of conversation and dialogue about the kinds of films that they're making. So I do think, you know, for both for festivals and for arts institutions, it's important to think about, yes, the film, the storytelling, but certainly, you know, the, the context in which that film is going to be viewed and the context in which the film was made. I just want to thank you all for being here, but also back to where we started for widening that circle of compassion um, with this work and with all that you all do. So thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, CPD, for all that you do.